Hello, Fountain of Life. We're glad that you're joining us on this Facebook Live or maybe watching this uh, a little bit later on YouTube. We thank you for participating today. I've got a great Bible study for you tonight. I think it's going to really encourage you, help you, and and I think you'll be richer as a result of studying the Word of God uh, after we, we look into some things tonight. We're going to talk about how that God wants us to change and the importance of change and, and even some of the processes and the phases that we kind of go through as we change. And so anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, I'm Pastor Bob Millsaps, Pastor of Fountain of Life Christian Center, and we're glad that you are with us uh, today. But anyway, I just want to let you understand that, of course, we know God is in the business of changing lives. There have been many, many testimonies across millennia of, of lives that have been transformed completely you know, by the power of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, nobody can change a life like Jesus Christ. And tonight we're going to look at how God changes, uh, helps us to change for the better. Uh, to, to be able to make the changes we want to make in our life and, and the changes that God wants to make in our lives, we, we need to understand uh, some important things. And so when God wants to make uh, us to change, what he does, he takes us through four different steps, four different phases in in our life. And uh, I want to really begin, uh, and we're going to look at the person of Jacob in the Old Testament out of Genesis chapter 32. But before we jump over to Genesis 32, I'd like to read to you uh, just one verse today out of, the, out of the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It's been one of my favorite verses. I've preached on it several times, but, but it's out of Hebrews 11 and verse number 21. It talks about Jacob here, right? This is kind of God looking back at Jacob's life, right? And he says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Here you have a picture of a man who is in the dying phases of his life. He's blessing his children, and we see him, and he's got this staff. It's like a big pole that he's leaning on, and he's worshiping the Lord. That staff is very, very significant in the life of Jacob because it represents the fact that God changed him, all right? So we're going to get back to that at the end of this Bible study. But anyway, when God wants us to change, he takes us through four steps, four phases. And when you understand this about your life, your life is going to start making a lot more sense, right? And the first phase God allows you and I to go through, all of us, when he wants to change us, is he allows us to go through a phase of crisis. Now, nobody likes to think about that. Everybody hates that. We want our life to be wonderful and perfect, no problems, great, you know. But that's actually not the way life is. We all face crises in our life. So if you're, are you in a crisis today? Well, let me just congratulate you, all right? You're about to be changed, right? God is getting ready to make a change in your life. Seems like our whole world is in a crisis right now. COVID-19 has affected everybody and everything. And, and this produced a lot of crises in people's life. And I think God's using all of that to bring believers to be more like Jesus Christ. And uh, let me just say this today, that, that your biggest battle in life is not really your physical battle. It's not your physical health. It's not your financial battle. You, you probably you might think it is, uh, and your in your in your 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 biggest battle in life is not really your relational battle or other people or you know or dealing with your career or dealing with your past. No, the truth is now follow me that our biggest struggle in life is with God. Am I right? Our biggest struggle in life is with God. And a crisis is when we struggle with God because we want to be God, okay? We want to be in control. We don't want the crisis in our life. And today we're going to see an amazing example of this in the Bible. Back in Genesis chapter 32, we have the story of Jacob and a very unusual wrestling match, okay? Because in this wrestling match, Jacob was his opponent was actually God. 
Uh, I mean, you know, some of you may watch that, I don't know what you call it, WWF, and you think that's exciting. Well, let me tell you, that's nowhere near exciting as wrestling with God, I can assure you. But Jacob wrestled with God. So let me read to you a portion of that out of the New Living Translation. Genesis chapter 3, verses 20, I mean, sorry, Genesis 32, verse 24 and 25. It says this, then Jacob was left alone, all alone in the camp. Now, I want you to understand something today. He was getting ready to meet the very brother that he had swindled this brother out of his life's inheritance. Jacob is scared to death. So that night he wanted to be left alone. So he sends his wife and kids on ahead to meet his brother. Well, real brave, right? I mean, he's, he's waiting. He, he's scared of confrontation. He's been running all his life, and, and now he's alone. It says, Jacob was left all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until dawn. And when the man saw that he couldn't win the match, he struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of joint at the so socket. Now, some people kind of want to debate who Jacob is wrestling here, but the Bible actually tells us exactly who he was wrestling, all right? If you go to Hosea chapter 12 and verse number 3, the New Living Translation says this, Before Jacob was born, this is Hosea 12, 3, New Living Translation, Before Jacob was born, he struggled with his brother. But when he became a man, he even fought with God. Wow. Wow. I mean, this guy fought God all. This guy fought all of his life. Uh, so, the question becomes: How do you struggle with your brother before you were born? Well, he was a twin, right? Even in the womb, the Bible says they were kind of like duking it out in the womb. In fact, when his older brother Esau, this very same guy he stole his birthright from, uh, when he was born, first the Bible says, excuse me, when Esau was born first. The Bible says that Jacob, the other baby, was actually just gripping onto, holding on to his ankle as Esau came out of the womb, almost saying, how dare you get in front of me? I'm going to try to hold you back and trip you up. And all of his life, Jacob has been struggling with his brother, but actually his biggest battle was with God. And I know for those of you who maybe like Bible trivia, okay, there's a little pun in this verse. It's kind of fascinating. The Hebrew word for Jacob, right? J-A-C-O-B is Jacob. And the Hebrew word for wrestling is Jabek, J-A-B-E-C. And the Hebrew word for the Jabbok River is J-A-B-B-O-K, right? So what we have in this story is Jacob Jabek God at Jabbok, okay? Kind of a little pun in the Bible, a little play on words. Sometimes God sneaks a little humor in there. But but I want you to take a moment to, today and, and think of your biggest conflict, the biggest problem that you've got right now. It, it probably ought to just jump into your mind pretty quick there. But regardless of what that problem is, I can tell you two things about it, okay? All boils down to these two issues. First of all, number one, will I obey God in this situation and do what he says is the right thing to do whether I like it or not? That's one of the key issues, right? And then secondly, will I trust God in this situation to handle it? So no matter what your problem is, if it's financial, physical, relational, social, career-wise, no matter what it is, it comes down to those two things. Am I going to do the right thing and obey God? And number two, am I going to trust God to handle it for me? Your biggest problem really isn't your biggest problem. Your problem is either not obeying God or not trusting God. And, and that makes the problem bigger, right? The root of all your problems really is our struggle with God. You see, we want to be God. We want to be in control. I don't know about you, but I like being in control, right? Give me the remote. Let me control that. Give me the car. Let me control that. 
and I want to control my health, but guess what? I can't always control my health. Sometimes I get sick. Or I want to be God and say, no, I don't want to get sick. And certainly as you get older, we don't want to have any, you know, debilitating thing like cancer, right? We want to be in control, right? Right? So we've got to, we, so we want to trust, we have to trust God in those situations. So our, our, our rustling is with God in our finances. Well, man, we want to be blessed. No problems at all. When we lose our job. We get upset at God. You know, you know wait a minute here. We want to be in control, right? See, that's what it's all about. And so what God does is he allows a, a boiling point and, and he allows a crisis. And, and so many of us are familiar with that. There's this wrestling match with God. And, and you know, you say, well, what's the objective in wrestling? Well, I'm talking about real wrestling, okay? Not this kind of, you know, television stuff where they jump off the ropes and all that. Uh I'm actually from Worthington, Minnesota, which is the junior college wrestling capital of the world. And I have seen many, many wrestling matches. And, and I know that the real objective in a wrestling match is to pin the guy to the mat, knock him down, lay him out flat, get control over him until he says, I give, you're in control, and you win. And all your life, you've been in that battle with God. And the battle is this, who's going to be the number one in your life? Are you going to call the shots or does God get to call the shots? You've been struggling with God and that is kind of like the root of every problem, right? It boils down to those two things. Am I going to obey God and do what he tells me? Am I going to trust God? Those two key issues. And uh, as we read that passage there, it says, it says that he couldn't win the match. The man who was wrestling with, with Jacob, it says he could not win the match. And so it was kind of a no-win situation. And, and uh, some of you are maybe in that a no-win situation right now. And, and let me ask you something. Who do you think is behind that? Could it be God? I'm just asking. God backs us into a corner. Why? Because God often allows a crisis in our life to get our attention. Kind of like a megaphone from heaven, a telephone call from heaven, an email from God. You know, he's going to try to get your attention through a crisis. And, uh, you know, you might have heard me say this before, but, you know, God loves us just the way we are. Sure he does. Absolutely. But God loves us the way we are, but he loves us far too much to allow us to stay in the same condition that we are. And the truth is, God's major purpose in your life is not your comfort. It is for you to change. He wants to help you grow, to be better, to be different, to be all that you were meant to be. And so what does God do? He allows a crisis. Why? Here's the reason why. Because the truth is we really don't change unless we feel enough pain. And that pain begins to exceed our fear of changing that's when we change. Someone cutely coined this little phrase, we don't change when we see the light, we change when we feel the heat, right? And so some of you might be in phase one today where you're feeling you're in this crisis, okay? And you're saying, well, what do I do? I'm in this crisis, I, you know, I want to trust God, you know, I want to obey God, what do I do? Here's what you do. You need to make a, in the second, here's the second phase, the second step is you make a commitment to get a hold of God and not let him go. To not let go of God. I'm telling you, God is the answer. We're fighting with him, but he also is the answer. We've got to grip him and not let him go. Right? Uh, what we're saying is, we're saying to God is, I'm going to stick with this until I get something out of it. Because if you give up, you're going to miss the blessing, right? And I want you to notice Genesis chapter 32 and verse 26. It says, Then the man said, Let me go, for it's dawn. But Jacob panted, okay? He's out of breath. He's weary. He's been fighting this guy all night long. And he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. Now, I don't know whether if Jacob knew he was wrestling with God or not. I think later, later he knew it. But somehow he, he figured out that the one he was wrestling with was more powerful than him and could bless him, and so he was not going to let go. He said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Obviously, uh, because this is God that he's fighting with. How many of you know God could have overpowered Jacob, I mean, right then and there and ended the match? And so we got to ask ourselves, 
you know, why did God let the struggle go on? I mean, he'd been wrestling him all night long. Why did he do that? I have you know, God can knock you to the ground, pin you there, cause you to say uncle right now, right? But he, God could have ended it really quickly, but he didn't. So here's the lesson, all right? Keep with me. When God allows a crisis into our lives, sometimes he doesn't solve it immediately. He lets it go on for a while. He doesn't solve the crisis. And here's the reason why. God wants to see if you really mean business. Do you really have a commitment to him? Uh, if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to get something out of your relationship with God, is this just a whim or is it a, a real desire? And so we have to ask ourselves the question, well, you know, what if God answered every one of our prayers immediately? Hey, God, I need a car. Bam, there it is. Hey, thank you. I need a new house. Oh, yeah, here's the, here's the address. It's all yours. No payments, nothing. You know, how many of you know uh, that would not be very good for us, right? In fact, if you got everything that you wanted, you'd be the most spoiled, selfish person. So God doesn't answer all your prayers immediately he lets you struggle for a while and uh you know and if god answered all your prayers immediately you would think that god was uh just a giant big vending machine you know put in a prayer pull out the answer whatever you need you know but but uh, that's just not the way it works sometimes god allows us to struggle god allows things to continue on and that's when we've got to hold on to God. That's when we've got to persevere. That's when we've got to lay hold of him, as the old timers used to say. Now, I can't tell you how many times in my life people have said something to me like, uh, you know, Pastor Bob, I'm, I'm just praying for this financial miracle in my life. I'm so in debt, and I'm just praying that God will just remove all that debt immediately and just a financial miracle. And I kind of want to say, I've never had the courage to say it, but I kind of want to say, you know, did you get in debt supernaturally? Uh, the truth is no. You know, we, we work hard at getting in debt. I'm including myself there, right? You know, you know, we make stupid financial decisions and we spend more money than we make and, and we don't save for the crisis that are ever, inevitably going to come in life. We don't use our money wise, wisely. And so, you know, why, why is it that God should just bail us out? You know, if God just instantly bailed us out of our financial crisis tomorrow, We'd probably just go out and overspend again, right? You'd feel, you know, God just, you know, bail me out every time. So, you know, I'll just go out and get in debt again, you know. And the bottom line would be this, right? Now, follow me. Hope you're following me. You'd learn no character. You'd learn no discipline, no money management. You would have no wisdom. You would have no persistence. So, so God isn't going to bail you out of, of every debt that you get yourself into. Now, I'm not saying God won't help you get out of debt. Certainly he will, but he'll help you get out of debt the same way you got in, generally one payment at a time. Hello. Uh, you know, and, and the reason for that is God wants to build your character. He wants you to, to teach you persistence, and that's why we've got to cling to him. We've got to say, God, I am not letting you go. And many people... I think they miss God's best in life because they simply give up too soon. You know, uh, someone said, well, I prayed about it. Well, how many times? Well, I prayed twice. Oh, well, that's nothing, right? You know, God is looking to see if you really mean business. Do you mean enough business with God that you'll pray about that thing over and over and over again, consistently pounding the gates of heaven? Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 tells us this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. So the question is, are you in a crisis right now? Are you having a major problem? Cling to God. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't cop out. Don't run from it. Don't try to escape. Stick with it. Stick with God. The problems that you have in your life, those personal problems, you know, the hang-ups, you didn't get them overnight. You know, a lot of times we, you know, it takes us years to work ourselves into the mess that we have. Never forget one day I was talking with my dad and he kind of went on a little rant. I don't even know who he is talking to on the phone. He was a pastor at the time. And he's like, I don't get it. People get themselves in a mess and they intertangle and intertwine all this junk in their life and expect God to straighten it out in a single day. It doesn't work that way. He was just frustrated. 
you know, but the truth is we've got a lot of ingrained patterns. They didn't come over overnight. You know, we worked at getting those patterns of thought. Sometimes we have bad responses, wrong habits, wrong ways of responding. And, and we have these insecurities that have built up years over years. Listen, God doesn't remove all that stuff at once. What he actually does, he kind of like peels. It's kind of like peeling an onion. He kind of removes one layer at a time. And that's really the value of having a good Christian friend, you know, someone that you share your life with. It's the value of having good Christian counselors in your life, or, or and maybe you need to see a Christian counselor. I don't know. Uh, you know, I know from my involvement in Celebrate Recovery, it just kind of seems like that's what happens. You know, people don't change overnight, but as they peel layer after layer, they get down to the core issue, and all of a sudden they find themselves completely transform and so and so uh, you know it, it, God helps us to remove all of our habits hang-ups and hurts you know just kind of like one layer at a time and sometimes it takes us a long time to wise up and then be able to give it to God what I'm saying by that it takes us a long time to wise up and start obeying God a long time to wise up and start trusting God in our situation and uh and so these are the phases. First comes the crisis, and then there comes the commitment. And I, and I pray that if you're in that commitment phase, that you're holding on to God tightly today. Hold on to him. Cling to him. And then we come to the, the, the third phase where it is really a confession, all right? And in this phase, what we do is we actually admit that we're the problem. What? I thought it was my wife, it's my boss, it's, uh, you know, it's somebody else's fault. Really? Are you sure? Uh, we stop blaming people and we need, we, we start admitting, I am the problem with my life. And until you get this, there's not going to be any major changes in your life. And, and this is really the breakthrough, right? This is, this is when we have this confession and we admit that we're the problem and we see this in the like life of Jacob, right? First, there's this crisis, right? He's got to meet his brother. And, and uh, you know, he winds up wrestling with God uh, about that. And and then he's he's in this commitment phase and he's clinging. He's like, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And, and then in Genesis 32 and verse 27, it says, the man asked him, speaking of Jacob, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Now, Kind of a very strange question because, kind of a strange request from God, because obviously God already knew Jacob's name. And so, you know, well, why is he asking Jacob about his name? Not because he needed to know, but because Jacob really needed to own up to who he was. Now, in ancient cultures, you were always named for your character, what you really were, you, you know, like... I know in our culture, you, you hear a guy who has a nickname of Tiny. Guess what? He raised, weighs 375 pounds, right? That's not who he really is. We've got the shorty, but he's actually six foot nine, you know? Uh, not, not, not like that. But in, in, those, in those days, if you were tall or short or brave or, or, or lazy, that would be kind of like become your label. It was your name. It wasn't just something that sounded nice. It represented who you were. It represented your character, and there's a problem with that because Jacob literally means, in that language, it means trickster. It means a deceiver, a manipulator, a liar. You know, it's a cup of a guy who would cheat you out of your last dollar. And Jacob had lived up to his name his entire life. I mean, he ripped off everybody. He lied to his dad, who was going to blind, deceived him into thinking he was somebody else. He cheated his brother out of his rightful inheritance, right? He used his father-in-law. He used his wives and then uh, his wife and then later his wives. He was just a big manipulator. Even the very fact that he's sending his wives out in front to, you know, soften Esau's heart, you know, he's still using them. And so when Jacob says, my name is Jacob. What he's doing is he's actually owning up to who he really is. It's kind of an act of confession. It's a self-revelation. He's saying, I'm a, I'm a manipulator. He's admitting it. And whenever I read this verse, you know, I wonder, 
you know, uh, what, what our what our world would be like if everyone was named for their biggest character flaw. You know, I pray that that doesn't ever happen. You know, I don't want you to know my character flaws and and uh, you know, so so. But but what would be your name? Let me ask you. I know what my name would be, but what would your name be? Hey, everybody, my name is Greedy, or maybe your name would be, hey, I'm Bitter. My name is Anger, uh, you know, or I have an, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm an uncontrollable temper. I'm lustful. I, I, I'm a user. Uh, or maybe it would be I'm depressed. I'm fearful. I'm angry. I'm afraid. What, what would your name be if you were named after your biggest character flaw? And uh, here's the insight into this today, all right? Follow with me. You will never be able to change until you are able to openly, honestly, and authentically admit your sin, your faults, and your weaknesses. You need to be able to admit your faults and your character, you know, whatever character defects you have, not only to yourself, but to God and to other people. And I need to do the very same thing. And, uh, you know, uh, some people might be thinking, oh, no, man, I mean, I, I can deal with me and God. You know, I'm glad to talk to God about this, you know, but I'm not admitting, you know, who I am on the inside to somebody else. Let me tell you something. That's a healing thing to do. It's a powerful thing to do. That's why God has Christian counselors. That's why, actually, I think God gave us spouses. That's why God gave us brothers in Christ who know us deeply. That's why God gave us pastors and teachers and spiritual leaders. That's why there are groups within many churches that, that, that this takes place in because God says this, that God opposes the proud. And if you're too proud to admit it, man, you, you know, let me tell you something. You're opposing God. In other words, you're raising your fist to God. You're right now in a fight with him. You're in a war with God because God does not like prideful, egotistical people. God opposes proud people. But the scripture says he gives grace to the humble. You say, well, what is grace? Grace is the power to change. And one of the most humbling things in the world to do is to be able to say, this is who I am. I'm a blank. You know, you could just fill in the blank. I'm a warrior. You know, I'm a domineering person. You know, I'm a person who runs from conflict. I, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. You know, I'm a drug user. I'm a manipulator. Fill in the blank. And, and just, just stop making excuses, all right? If you want to change, you've got to stop rationalizing, stop justifying, stop blaming other people. You've got to come clean about whatever, you know, about what, Everybody else sees in you, but what you won't admit is really going on on, on the inside. And let me tell you something. When you come to God and you say, God, I want to own up to my own weaknesses, the filth, the wrong, whatever the junk that's in my life, the dishonesty, whatever it is, you say, God, this is who I really am. Let me tell you something. God is not going to be surprised, all right? He's not going to fall off his throne and say, What? You pulled the wool way over my eyes. I can't believe that's who you really are. How could I have missed that? No. Listen, God's been watching you since the day you were born. He knows everything about you. He knows every breath you've took. He knows every step you've taken. He knows every mistake you've made. God already knows. You just need to own up to it yourself and own up to it to at least, I think, one other person. God already knows, and you need to own up to yourself and others. And that's the most difficult part of, of change. And so, then what we come to that's the, that's really the third the third the third phase, right? It's that confession, that getting it out, saying this is who I am. That's what happened to Jacob, right? He said, God, you know, God had him. He had God, and God says, Who are you? He says, My name is Jacob. He's saying, I'm a deceiver. I'm a manipulator. I'm a trickster. You know, that's what he was saying to God. And then the fourth phase came, which I want to just simply call it conversion. Conversion. Something happened to Jacob, right? In a conversion, you're given a new identity. Oh, man, I really love this. I want you to look at God's loving and gracious response to Jacob's confession. I mean, it must have been hard for him to say to God, this is who I really am. You know, I, 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 am, I am Jacob. I am a manipulator. Genesis 32, verse 28 in the New Living Translation. It says, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, 
but Israel. Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face. And so now the transformation begins. I want you to notice that three things happened. The first thing that happened was he was given a brand new identity. God says, your name's Jacob, manipulator. Well, hey, listen, that's the old you. We're not going to call you by that name anymore. I'm going to change your name, and we're going to call you Israel, which actually means prince with God. How many of you know that's way different than manipulator? He says, yes, you've been Jacob, but now you're going to introduce yourself as Israel. How crazy that there's a whole nation that's still named after this guy. God says to this guy, he says, look, I know you've blown it. I know, you know, you've, you've been conniving. But God says, look, inside of you, I see a prince beneath all of your emotional hangups, all your insecurities, all the stuff you don't want anybody to, else to see and know about. I see a prince. And God would say that, I believe, to many people believers today to many people today as you cling to God okay as you hold on to him as you confess this is who I really am God would come into your life and say you know what I see I see a prince there I see a winner there. I see a conqueror there. I see a good person there. I see an honest man there. I see a, a loving wife there. I see a good husband there. God would say that to many people today. Beneath all the sins, beneath all the wrongs you've ever done in life, God says to you, I see great potential in you. You can become something great. You can become what I made you to be. Uh, but you've got to own up to it. And so we own up to it. And what God does, God says, look, I'm giving you a new identity. And uh, uh, many times in the Bible, God changed people's names, right? You know, he not only changed, you know, Jacob's name to Israel. He also changed, you know, Cephas' name to Peter. Cephas was meant a reed. That means he was easily swayed like a reed in the wind. But he says, no, you're not going to be a reed anymore. You're a rock. Right? He changed Abram to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Well, at that time, he didn't have anybody to be a father to. He says, well, I'm, now I'm going to start calling you father of multitudes, the father of many. And uh, that's, that's, that's what God does. He, he changes us and gives us a new identity. Listen, if you're brand new to the faith, you need to realize that your identity is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what your mother called you, what your boss said about you, what the teacher said. You know, I mean, I, you know, some, some of those things happened to me. Some people said some bad things about me. But listen, listen, that's not my, I don't accept that as who you are on the inside. Accept what God says about you. God says you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He says I've made you more than a conqueror. He says you're a winner. You're a champion. You can excel. You can be what I made you to be. Get that identity of Christ deep inside of him. Then the second thing that happened was he says then he blessed him there. You know, as Jacob started, uh, not, not Jacob now, as Israel started living out that new identity, God started continued to bless him right uh, you know, let me tell you something if you want god's blessing you've got to take those steps and uh, maybe today you, you know the, the reason why you're fighting with god is there's just some things you don't want to obey him on you know whatever that issue is just say god i'm gonna start obeying you win i surrender this is who i am i've been rebellious but guess what i'm gonna i'm gonna start obeying you i'm gonna start trusting you and let me tell you something. You'll discover that there's a wonderful God that's kind and good, and he will bless. And then the third thing that happened was, he not only was given a new identity, not only God bless him, but he was given a reminder of, exper of his experience so that he would never forget what happened to him for the rest of his life. And it's amazing what God gave him, all right? God gave him a lamp, okay? God gave him a limp. Remember, in the wrestling match, his hip was put out of joint. And uh, for the rest of Jacob's life, he walked with a limp. It says, uh, the, the, it continues on in the narrative, and it says, The sun rose as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Now, re remember in the struggle that God had dislocated his hip and left a weakness. And Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life that was a reminder 
of that event. And uh, you say, is God going to dislocate my hip? I, I hope not. I hope not. But when you really meet God, here's the point, okay? You will never walk the same again. If you say, I'm a Christian, and your life has never, ever really changed, if you're the exact same person that you used to be, and you've never changed, nothing's different in your life, I, you know, maybe you're not really a Christian, maybe you really haven't met God, because when God meets you, and you have a fight with them, and he wrestles you to the ground, and he pins you down, let me tell you something, he will change you, your desires change, your heart changes, and uh, Jacob would never walk the same Again, you say, well, what's the significance of this limp? A couple of things, all right? First of all, it stopped Jacob's lifelong pattern of running. If you know anything about Jacob's life, you know that he was constantly creating trouble and then he would run away from it. He'd create a problem and then he would run away. He was always trying to escape. He was the most irresponsible uh, type of a person that you could imagine running from problems that he created. And God said, well, guess what? We can stop that. We're going to give you a limp. You'll never run again. It's a reminder. And let me tell you, it's never God's will for you to run from a problem. Uh, never. If you run from it, you're just going to come up against that same problem again because, you see, God's more interested in changing your character than in making you comfortable. Okay? The other thing about this limp is that it's a daily reminder to depend upon God. Your thigh muscle is the largest and the strongest muscle in your body. And God touched Jacob at his point of greatest strength and created a weakness out of it. From that point on, Jacob was not going to have to stand uh, on his own power, but on God's power. Jacob leaves this situation actually both stronger and weaker. Stronger in that he's not the same anymore. He has had a conversion. All the junk in his past has been dealt with, but also weaker because now he's going to have to depend upon God for his daily walk. And we have to remember to depend upon God for his strength and not our own. And this might be the very most important thing that I say to you in this Bible study. Hear me today. God does his deepest work in your life when he deals with your identity, who you are, the way you see yourself, your self-perception, the way uh, you, you, you think of yourself affects everything else in your life. If you see yourself as such and such a person, you tend to act in accordance with that self-image. If you say, well, I'm shy or I'm outgoing, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, it kind of becomes a almost like a self fulfilling prophecy all right and so you're going to tend to act according to the way you think about yourself and so god does his deepest changes in our life by changing the way you see yourself and he says let me show you how i see you and he sees us always through eyes of unconditional love and so when you see yourself the way God sees you, I believe it's going to change your life and you'll start acting in a whole new way. Listen, only Jesus Christ can change a person. I honestly believe that. There's nothing else that can change people so radically as Jesus Christ. I, I'm telling you, I don't know where I would be today if it wouldn't be for Jesus Christ. You know, I've got plenty of character flaws and weaknesses, but... You know, I, I hate to think of what my life would be like had I never surrendered those things to God, allowed God to pin me to the ground and said, God, okay, I'm obeying. I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to trust you in this situation. He's a specialist in new identities, right? If anybody belongs to Christ, the Scripture says they're a new creation. The old things of God, everything is new, made new. And I, in my mind, I think once again, go back to that Scripture of Jacob in the book of Hebrews, he's there as the dying moments of his life, right? He's leaning on his staff and he's worshiping God. All those many years he's walked with that staff. He's had to depend upon God. He's had to trust God. He's had to know who God was. And now in this final moments and final praise and worship, he's honoring God. You know what he's honoring God about? A changed life. And that can be you, my friend as you come and submit to God. And so I've got to ask you a couple of personal questions as we bring this Bible study to a close. The first question is this, in what areas are you struggling with God? You don't have to tell me 
course not. You talk to God about it. Maybe you need to call a close friend and talk to them about it. But, you know, uh, maybe there's just something you know you need to do, but you keep kind of just keep ignoring God. You're fighting God on it. You know what you ought to do. You know it's right, but you're not obeying. Listen, allow him to win, all right? You can't win in a fight with God. Start obeying, you know? Or maybe, you know, you're in a situation and, and it's this crisis and you, you've got to trust God in it and it just feels so difficult. Listen, just yield to God and say, God, I'm not going to let go of you. I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Stop being afraid and, and just let go and let God trust your life. The second question is, in what areas have you felt like giving up? Maybe, maybe it just seems easier to walk away, to quit. A lot of people have done that even with God. They've walked away from the church. They've walked away from their church friends. They've, you know, listen, you better cling to God. You better hold on to him. You, you might be in a point right now where, you know, your marriage is just on the rocks and you're thinking, I'm just going to walk away. Listen, cling to God. Let him show you. Cling to God. Uh, you know, get counseling, you know. Uh, you know, and the third thing might be is, you know, what do you need to admit about yourself? You know, maybe... You, you know, you need to face the truth about yourself today. Maybe that's what this study's all about, to get you to say, hey, this is who I really am. And have the courage to, to share that with somebody. Have courage to share that with somebody close uh, that, that you know. And share it with somebody. Share it with God. Share it with a group of people. Someone said a long time ago, revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. Man, I like that. Revealing what's going on. That's the beginning of healing. That's when the process starts. And then the last question is, will you allow Christ to give you a new identity today? God knows everything about us, all the emotional hang up, the baggage that we have. And listen, God he looks underneath all of that and says, I see a prince or a princess in you. And uh, he sees your potential. You don't have to stay the same. And so you need to just ask God to come and change your life. And he'll do that today. Can I pray with you today? Heavenly Father, I pray for my friend that's been listening. I pray that you would love and encourage them, hold on to them. And uh, God, as they're in that struggle with you, I pray that you give them the courage to begin obeying you, Lord. Give them the courage, Lord, to recognize that they're not God and that they can't change all circumstances and control all of life. So, God, they're in a position they've got to trust you, Lord. I, I pray that you would encourage them to trust you in Jesus' name. God, to hold on to you. Change every life that's listening to this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We want to encourage you to come out, be a part of our uh, morning worship service on Sunday at 1030 a.m. here at Fountain of Life uh, Christian Center in Houston, Texas. Or uh, watch us online on Facebook Live at 1030. May God richly bless you, and, and may you enjoy the rest of this evening. God bless.